And with that, I would like to welcome and, and thank my co-presenter and the lead on this, Mohammed, who is here with us from the Office of Equity and Inclusion this morning. He will be kicking it off for us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, uh, this session. I think as you can see, uh, the title of uh, the session is basically acknowledging that all peers and peer wellness play in Oregon's health system. My name again is Abdesis Mohammed. I work with the Oregon Health Authority of Sabakud and Inclusion. I'll be the main guy. He got willing to take all the bullets and frustrations that many of you have witnessed and uh, uh, came through the system when you are seeking for your state certification. Uh, part of this session today, and that's one of the things that I am in charge of, making sure the certification of PSP awareness and then other tradition health workers, which we may use a little bit here and there in the state, uh, uh, are responsible for it. Uh, I want to acknowledge and uh, state to all of you that if any of you feels like you want to, you know, vent on your frustration of how it is not working, I'm here to listen. My job is to listen and acknowledge that as well as continue to find a way uh, to get, you know, feedback suggestions from the participants and, you know, and everyone else in between. What can we make, you know, to make it better for people, uh, this certification. So, and then also technically, like, uh, we would, uh, I will talk through a lot of several slides that we have for you here, but above all, uh, you know, the certification part of it is in there. And then other key things that, you know, peers and uh, roles play within the state. So those are other things we will discuss through this session. My co-presenter, Ms. Adrian, also will take some part of it uh, regarding peer supervision and other stuff that we intended to uh, bring in into the session. And in the end, you know, uh, my hope will be take the questions as we go so that we will be able to answer most of the questions all of you may have. So that way, uh, nothing, you know, feels left out. So that is what we would be uh, going through for the day. With that, I would love to go to, you know, uh, looking at the first slide you all have, uh, it kind of shows you how uh, peer support, you know, uh, one other thing, let me take a step back. Many of you may hear a lot about what is traditional health worker, what is peer, we are all confused, what is family peer, what is this. So the state of Oregon uses an umbrella term to put together all, you know, uh, uh, preventative and behavioral health workforce in the state of Oregon under this traditional health, health work umbrella, which is, you know, we have a, a traditional health workers, but family peers, youth peers, peer wellness, as well as peer support in our adult tradition, adult mental health, all fall under this bucket of the traditional health worker uh, that the state uses everybody to lump them in that group. And particularly, uh, we have other traditional health workers who are part of that bucket of, you know, under the umbrella. These are like community health workers, if you have had them before, or doulas or other people. But for the purpose of this session, we're going to focus on peer support specialists with our digital mental health, as well as family support, youth support, and then our peer wellness. That would be the focus of this. But you may see areas where traditional health workers might be mentioned. It's just particularly this is all an umbrella term that the state uses uh, uh, to understand, you know, how we work in, in terms of the state of Oregon, which is a little bit different from other states around the, around the nation. You wanna go to the next slide, Miss? Okay, so uh, the goal would be, you know, define what are the community-based uh, integrated behavioral care, healthcare delivery models we have and understand, you know, why uh, uh, peers are very much important in the equitable of you know, health outcomes that we all want to foresee in terms of addiction, mental health. And then define, you know, the different categories, the roles of traditional health workers, mostly peers and peer wellness. And then, you know, we'll share some, you know, uh, current trends around peer, peer wellness workforce demographics statewide, which, you know, peer, peer, uh, uh, peer and peer wellness trainings. And then I'll share, share you know, uh, 
PMP wellness supervision, which uh, we will talk a little bit around that. And then lastly, you know, kind of give you an overview of some current payment models that exist for PMP wellness and then the utilization of peers, you know, and challenges that peers face in them in, in places. Uh, it is hard to condense everything in 90 minutes. We hope, you know, whatever we miss, my contact information and Adrian's contact information would be available to you all. You're always welcome to email and send us any question that or any piece of the presentation we fail to address for the day. Next slide. All right, so here's a quick question that I wanted to ask uh, uh, all of you. Uh, we, I call it food for, food for thought, but it's more a little bit of getting to hear your perspective. Where does Oregon rank in the nation in terms of mental health and addiction recovery as of June of 2020? How many of you know? So if you feel you know this, please help yourself to uh, unmute and then answer, shout out. Like, where do you think? We have about 50 states in the nation. Where do we rank? Are we in the top 10? Are we mid mid? Are we like, where are we? So if you want to share, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Third. I say third. You said third. Great to know that. Who else? I'm going to say top five at least. Top five. I've lived in a lot of different states. Top five. Uh -huh. Go ahead. I'm going to say number one. If not, let's get there. Number one. I like that. Anyone else? <laughs> Any guessings? Anyone else? I heard it was pretty high, to be completely honest with you. I think the last um, statistics that were out, Oregon actually had a really, really poor ranking as far as mental health addiction recovery. Well stated. Uh huh. What number would you grade us if you were today the governor and deciding we need to be up there, we are from here, what number would you give us? I would say probably in the 30s. In the 30s. Uh, I'd have to agree with that. I, I'm thinking around, you know, the 20th, maybe rating rank uh, around that number. Interesting. I think probably we around 24th or 25th place. 24th. Penny. Uh -huh. I think um, maybe 22. I think in the rural areas, it's a lot. Uh, I think the metro areas are, are doing pretty good, but the rural areas, we, you know, we could use some improvement. Well, I'm wondering, um, just wondering what the qualification is for ranking. I mean, what are we talking about in terms of recovery? Is this a number of people in the hospital? Is it a number of mental health? Everything. Yeah. Like a bulk of, you know, how, how the state is doing in terms of like addressing from from behavioral health perspectives in terms of, you know, uh, uh, people getting the right support, the right structure, the right, you know, uh, things that is needed for them to really have a full recovery. That is what uh, uh, they looked at. We will unveil. We will unveil. I say seven. I, you will say seven. Okay. I, think seven. We're, I think we're really low. 37? 37. Well, well, thank you, though. Uh, I like the optimism. Uh, all of you are, like, energized, uh, you know, uh, putting it in where are we, and uh, we need to be better than every other state out there to really address this issue. Uh, uh, but, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, 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 can you go to the next, Ms. Adrian? So before we go there, go back a little bit and I will answer that. Uh, go to the previous uh, uh, slides here. So just so you know, with someone who works for state government, we rank number 48, which is very sad. 47, we are in 47th right now in the nation in terms of, as of like, you know, June 20, the Kaiser Family Foundation did a lot of work, uh, 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 did a lot of research uh, using both state data, federal data from SAMHSA and other things to rank, you know, which, which states, where are they at? We are in around 47, which is like very sad. So just to, you know, uh, I didn't mean to put down your optimism, uh, uh, but 
we are not doing very well in terms of when we talk about suicide prevention, I mean, with the substance use and addiction recovery, as well as mental health. We have a lot of, you know, we put so much energy, but uh, we have a lot of people out there, but it's not panning out the way it's supposed to be. Uh, so we are in 40, uh, 47 in the nation as of like June 2020. And the biggest impact which we will talk about later is with even uh, with COVID, it has exacerbated the, the challenges that we were coming way up, but then, you know, with COVID-19, it has exacerbated it more. Uh, families who used to rely on the schools are now locked up in their own houses. One counselor or one you know, QMAJ or one peer mentor or one CRM cannot be able to support, you know, how many families in their homes. Uh, kids are struggling with mental health. You know, youth, the same thing with addiction and mental health. The adults who had relied on other social support, they are not there. I was watching, you know, in, my, uh, in our group, I believe uh, someone mentioned that she can't wait to go back to work uh, because, you know, since COVID kicked in, maybe being out there for families and for other folks, we're not even out there helping folks. Do their mental health go away? No. They are, start, they are struggling. They are like, you know, dealing with it. But then the resources is not so stretched enough to reach every family that really and every individual that deserves it. That is what, you know, why we are ranked so low. Uh, and I think we have a long way to go. With all of your support and synergy, I believe we can come off this around. But I have been working with the state government for the last four years. Every presentation I made, I have never seen this number really go up, seriously. And I'm like, what is going on? What else can be done? It was between eight of, in the 40s all the time. And I'm like, I think we have a lot of foundation, a lot of structure. What else could be done? But this is the struggle. So I just wanted to mention that and thank you for all like uh, the optimism, you know, putting us in grade number one to the 30s to the, you know, mid 20s. But just so you know, it, we have a lot of work to be done. I applaud each and each one of you uh, in, in your individual lives and, you know, services to you all you do for consumers in Oregon. Uh, uh, thank you for what you do. And we would have to continue to do more to support, you know, more families, more individuals, more youth to really, you know, carve the trends we are facing right now. You want to go to the next slide? Yes, and I see that Joel has a hand up. Joel, yes. do you have a question? Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, I'm just kind of wondering when there was just a big shuffle because, like, in Medford, our VA was – ranked really, really high for mental health and addiction recovery, but then they changed everything. So what was the big change? What, I mean, does that make sense? I'm not, I'm not really sure how to say it. I just, I know that we are really high and now we're really low and I'm just kind of wondering what, what brought and, that about. And so you're right. Uh, w one thing I think uh, like I hear around the state when it comes to even working with our coordinated care organization system structure, we have so many disenfranchises of system. Our behavioral health delivery is not like robust, well-coordinated. We have like, you may see here, someone may be doing well in, in, you know, in Southern Oregon, Medford, but then, you know, someone in Eastern Oregon in Ontario, it's not going great. And then you go to, you know, coastal Oregon, the struggle is there. And then you go to, you know, central Oregon, there's a challenge too. So then you may do well in one part of the state, but there are other parts that resource wise, you know, like I was doing a presentation yesterday, someone saying you know, in 15 years, there was no these services even available in our state, like in our part of the state. So 15 years, when people were struggling, even if you bring, you know, a lot of behavioral health in now, when the adaptation, the connection, the trust, and the building, that takes time. And so that is why one part of the state cannot fix it for all, even here in the Tri-County, like Penny mentioned, there's a lot of resources, but is the resources coordinated well enough to really meet the demand and the need of every person? 
and even those who make this a living because of their lived experience and career, are they really looking this, you know, uh, to support individuals? Are they well supported, well paid? If you are not, then the technical of sticking around for the field and helping other people may not be there. You will move on. That leaves a gap and, you know, uh, a, a service gap that, that one person was addressing, but then it's difficult, you know, once they move on, replacing them with another, you know, peers becomes a challenge. That is the kind of snap challenges that we have across the spectrum. So we we're going to move on and we need to dive into a lot of other stuff. Uh, uh, next slide. And thank you, Joel, for the, uh, for the question. So what is a peer support? So, uh, you know, uh, uh, I borrowed this slide from Ms. Ali Limpot in Kalakamas. Uh, so it's a system of giving and receiving help founded on key principles of respect, shared responsibility, and a mutual agreement of what is helpful. So in the end of the day, you know, uh, I, this one is uh, to kind of, you know, remind you all the work you already do, uh, uh, that, you know, uh, peer support services is not based in psych psychiatric models and that's not the criteria. It is all about understanding another, you know, uh, a situation emp empathically through the shared experience of emotion and psychological pain. So uh, that is one thing I wanted to remind folks as you do this every day. I do see a lot of people coming into the peer world. Uh, Sometimes I go around the state to talk to different classroom and presentations and I ask them, you know, I give up, I would give them, you know, uh, some quote I really love uh, uh, where, uh, at the end of the day, you know, if you're not able to walk the talk and, you know, uh, talk the talk and be in the shoes of another fellow, you know, human being who's dealing with additional mental health that dealt the same way you are and understand them from where they come from, it's a challenging to do the work. Uh, a lot of people sometimes will come into the field not for the sake of want to make a change for others, but, you know, it's employment purposes. They are like eager to, uh, you know, make some money out of it. Uh, we have seen a lot of, you know, pieces, but that is not to say, you know, all peers are like that, but we have seen some people that will come in for the, to the field, you know, from other fields, uh, not really embodying uh, the lived experience element. And as all of you know, the state really highly requires in order for you to be a peer, you have to have a lived experience with either or, whether it's addiction, mental health, with families, with youth, wherever feel you are helping others, you know, to recover, you should be embodying that lived experience. Without that, this is not your charter or your territory probably. Maybe you should look for other fields because this is all about, it's not a four years degree school, it's all about the lived experience you bring in for others so that you can walk with them and talk the talk the same journey. This is, you know, a model that we always use, uh, organs, traditional health worker. Uh, you want to go to the next uh, uh, slide. So this is the, the initial slide I talked about. Uh, this is how organ uses when it comes to traditional health workers. But the intent is making sure you want to click next to next uh, so that we can build the bridge of why all of you are a bridge to the system. So you can see that is the structure all of you play in terms of making sure we have the individuals and the communities on the left the father side struggling with addiction, mental health, and, you know, the lack of support. But it takes, you know, this building bridge. And you can see, you know, going back, why are we 48 or 47? It's a long way to go to get there. We have this structure called coordinated care organizations and health systems that we have in the state, which are about now 15 of them in the state of Oregon that oversee a lot of our medical and you know behavioral health delivery of care. Are they all doing great? I'm not gonna lie to you. They are not all the same. There are some CCOs that do very great job in terms of you know coming this forth with the intent of real investment, real support for our systems so that, you know, the consumers in the service area really recover well. But then there are those who are still also in the trench, like, you know, challenges, like maybe this is a new chart or a new territory for them implementing, you know, uh, in that kind of services. But then it takes time for them to, you know, be like, you know, one of the other CCOs that are in one part of the state. 
and it is not unique, you know, we call CCUs and service areas. Each one has its own structure of how. So it is not like a robust, well-vetted, coordinated effort. So that can also add on into the challenges for the average Oregonian to really get a better care and, a, you know, a better services the way they will maybe if they lived in Tri-County, if they moved to, you know, uh, Coos Bay, Oregon, you can see the dynamics. Maybe the resources are not as you know robust as they were getting here. So, but overall, what peers do and peer wellness in in essence, you know, the outreach and mobilization with families, having that community cultural liaison, and then you know the case management, the care coordination, the system navigation, and then health promotion and coaching. Those are the things. So it's basically a, being a bridge between here on the far right of our coordinated care organization, our health system is, and on the left side, you can see it's red. That is the challenges families and communities and individuals face. And we are here in between, making this connection, making these dots, that's what the goal is, yeah. Uh, I see Penny has a hand on. Uh, we're gonna quickly go to you and then we're gonna move to the next slide. Um, thank you, yes, I, oh, so we are on the Oregon coast and our CCO, has educated and certified a lot of community health workers. But I know that the Oregon Health Authority wants us to survey and have a more diverse traditional health worker force, but currently we are only rolling out community health workers, which are amazing and they do amazing work, but it seems that the providers are more acceptable accept community health workers more readily because they're sort of more, uh, I don't know really how to say what I'm trying to say, but, um, and I know the, or, the OARs only suggest that we use traditional health workers. They don't require that we use traditional health workers for our new like social determinants of health program. So, so just, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that is a great point, but at the same time, uh, one of the new requirements for all coordinated care organization, and I can see, you know, uh, this is the challenges a lot of peers face uh, since we are talking about peers by, by, by say today. Uh, there are some providers, they put this connotation of, you know, with peers with previous, you know, addiction or mental health history, there's a lot of tendency associated with, okay, you know, peers are not clean, peers are not da 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 that has exacerbated the challenges for some providers choosing, you know, I'm a community health worker, but then I don't like that sentiment when a provider, uh, when I may not have the lived experience of addiction or mental health for me to really provide a robust services for another fellow peer. And it shouldn't be a choice of, of a, someone else because the provider likes X and then the other X are not so-called the system calls them they are not clean enough because maybe there's a history of you know uh, incarceration and other related effects that really affected people but then now what the state do through the coordinated care organizations uh contract the one that just kicked in in 2021 2020 we require all traditional health workers including peers and peer wellness are used to buy CCOs across the state and report on them, making sure the number of each traditional health workers they use, including peers and peer wellness, community health workers. It is not a choice of just maybe one part of the bulk of traditional health workers and then calling them they are great. All of them are great. So how do we diversify in terms of, you know, like the issues, for example, if mental health is not fully addressed or addiction is not fully addressed in some part of the state, bringing the right tool, the right expertise, the right people can really elevate and make a dynamic and shift in terms of those numbers. How can we make sure? And I think for me, you know, uh, someone, you know, who understands mental health and addiction, but when the community health worker role, it is very minimum to very much, you know, where addiction, uh, when, we, when we talk peers and peer wellness, their main focus is behavioral health delivery of addiction and mental health support. And if any provider, you know, wants to change the trend, like we talked about bouncing us from 48 to maybe in the grade one or 20, we should be aiming, 
how do we come in like we're not choosing one provider over the other, but how can we diversify our resources so that with the addiction mental health, we are willing to go farther down the road, you know, so that we are stretching and addressing all systems levels of challenges that a lot of community members face. And that is the goal and that is the expectation that, you know, uh, and you mentioned ORS, there's state rules that cater specifically for uh, organ administrative rules that require CCOs to use this. And then each CCO has a main contract that really calls out that they have to report on this number, how they are using it, how many of these numbers of their THWs, including ever five of them, uh, I mean the seven of them, even family peer, so that they can report and showcase that they are not using one worker type, but they are using all to address, you know, a robust wraparound holistic health system so that everyone wins. So that's one thing I would just respond to. You wanna go to the next slide? Thank you, Benny. So this is, you know, mental health and substance use state fact. You can see that's why we are 48. I mean, 47. The bulk part, the only states as far as I know is Florida and Louisiana. That is the bottom of us. And then we become third in the nation, which makes us 47. And you can see Washington, our neighbors, not far off from the blocks. They are like also having the same struggles and challenges. So Midwest, Western Oregon, Western states are, are doing great. California is a little bit better. But you can see, you know, all the way, the states we will so-called somehow, we will maybe associate them with, you know, they are not so liberal enough. They don't stretch maybe, be, you know, Medicaid and other stuff. Uh, they are, we are more in the same bucket right now. So I think it takes a lot of work and a well-coordinated effort to make sure we can improve this, bounce us from this, you know, dark blue to some maybe grayer blue down the road. And I think all of you with all the support will take a lot of work. Next slide. So this is what a recent, you know, survey, and this is where all the data I've been sharing comes from that, you know, consistently found that large years of adults reported their mental health uh, has been negatively impacted due to the worry and stress of the coronavirus. So all of you know that this was done as of June 2020 in the midst of COVID. So when we were doing before well even, we were not doing great, then you can really see the challenges that it brings in with COVID, loss of employment, loss of, you know, resources, and lack of, you know, now when peers were like, if you had, you know, maybe let's say, you know, one peer for, a 50 case managing like a between 40 to 20 people. Today, that peer, I think only works five days a week in the house. The likelihood of them being able to reach every single family in a daily basis is very minimal. So then there are families who will be on the brink of not being hard from. They are struggling alone, dealing with this, you know, in addition, it had added, you know, the COVID crisis too. And then mental health and substance use disorders are a key public health issue. Some states are calling this a public health crisis. Oregon is, is, is in, in that format as well, like the governor has called this a public health crisis because it is needs to be addressed. We just didn't know yet how to really figure it and address it well. You can see 17 million adults and you know, an and addition 3 million adolescents reported having major depressive disorder in the past year of 2019. That's a lot of number. Over 10 million adults deal with mental health, serious dose of suicide in the past year. This is a big challenge, and these are not like far enough. We're not talking in the 20, 2006 era. We're talking about one year ago. 14 million adults reported unmet health need of mental health and substance use disorder. This is the challenges we face because what? Like the one I mentioned, we're not far enough to, uh, to stretch and address amid, you know, everyone else. And then with the amid of, you know, COVID crisis, more than 30% of adults even reported, you know, a lot of anxiety and depressive disorder during the pandemic. So you can see this all exacerbates what we already like the lack of resources that existed and then it continues the trend a little bit more. Next slide. I'm flying through this so that we can have enough time for questions and answers. And then so, the need for mental health and substance abuse care is expected to increase more, just so you know it. And then you can see, you know, uh, 43, 41, 
2.3% of adults in Oregon reported symptoms of anxiety and depressive disorder compared to 36.5% of the U.S. adult population. So you can see there that compared nationwide, we have like a high number of 41%. And the share of adults, you know, in a, in, with the mental health, you can see that one is like 22.4 when the nation was from last year, 2017, you know, 2017, 2018, nationwide it was 19. So we were not doing even well in 2018 and 2017 era. The same thing goes down last day, like our youth are not doing very well in compared to the adults. And this has really, you know, increased the challenges that all of us are called upon to really address, you know, to meet them, you know, a mental health and addiction recovery work in a more maybe different way approach versus maybe the status quo because we have a lot of work to be done here even in local in the state of Oregon. Next slide. So this is an estimated, you know, you can see in 2029, we're not doing well. Like this is what the projection is. That tells you Oregon has a lot of work to be done. Like it is not doing very well in terms of substance use and recovery, there's a lot of challenges that we have to cover. You can see it's a rate by 100,000 population. We are in the low dark, dark blue. That tells you the work is a little bit ahead. Next slide. So here I wanna talk about the little bit fun part of what we do, how do we certify peers and in the state of Oregon and the training that is required. So generally, all of you know, uh, the state of Oregon provides certification for peers and peer wellness, families and youth support addiction in the addiction and health world. And that is what resulted those who are involved in the, you know, billing a system within our Medicaid system, which is not great so well in itself, but uh, we do what we do. We can work with what we can. So with our behavioral health delivery system, these are some of the things that are required in terms of statewide, how we deliver and what we need to do. And so all of you, you know, in order for you to be a certified peer within the state of Oregon, we don't call licensing. It's not a word in the, in the world of traditional health workers and in the world of peers are liked very well. The call outs like certification, they are more the same as licensing, but licensing is a connotation that's more affiliated with nurses, doctors, and other in the more medical world. Certification is something that we use so that it's more community-based, connection to the community. That's what we use for. Uh, I'm gonna finish this slide, Penny, and then we're gonna come to you. But technically what we require is that in order for you for, to become a peer, you require to provide, you know, get a training from one of the approved OHA training programs. And then that helps you to provide assessment. We don't take any tests, anything like that. It would be the training providing all that basic foundation to prepare you to understand the work and the field you are diving in yourself, that it is not so called where you're gonna make, you know, in the 60K figure or $100,000 field, but it is about changing life and impacting others to work with you, you know, in that journey so that they really feel someone out there has been listening to them and understanding them. And so uh, that uh, it's not a field people should come in for money. It's a field for, you know, making a difference for others to really see, you know, you help someone to really recover. That is the goal. And so the trainings provide these basic elements and foundations. And then with the state certification, we do have application process and other stuff, which I will dive in later. And then we will dive more about it, this part of it. And then when it comes to, you know, employment, Peers work in various, uh, peers and peer wellness work in a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of, you know, environments and settings. Uh, some work in clinical settings, some work in hospitals, some work in community-based settings, some work in, you know, in public health settings. So that's how it varies. And then there's a requirements of continuous education that peers are supposed to have in terms of for them to renew their certification. And I will talk about what is happening of the training now what's happening with continuous ed, I will address those challenges, that question that people may have. Uh, we'll go to the next slide and then we're gonna, uh, uh, Penny has a hand raised, so we're gonna bounce to there, yeah. Penny, you had a hand raised, yeah. 
Oh, yes. So our CCO has expressed some interest in perhaps um, training myself and my coworker in, in being a trainer for certifying people for per, uh, peer wellness and peer specialists. But we were unable really to find any information on how we could become a trainer. So good. Not to put you on the spot, uh, uh, and I would love Adrienne to jump in. Uh, she serves in one of the great subcommittees that the commission, the state has. Uh, before I bounce it, maybe I'll toss it back to Adrienne. Do you want to unmute yourself and answer maybe to Penny? What should be better, I think, in terms of, yeah, take it yes. off. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So, Penny, I think one of the important things to know about how traditional health worker certification training works in Oregon is that there is no standardized curriculum that is used. So on the committee, the Training Evaluation and Metrics Program Scoring Committee, or TEMPS, which is such a mouthful of a committee name, <laughs> what we do is review all of the training program applications for programs and agencies that are interested in becoming approved to provide traditional health worker certification trainings. So we do that for all of the different traditional health worker types, you know, peer support, peer wellness, family support, youth support included within that. So there is online on the Office of Equity and Inclusion website, there is a training application that has all of the information about the review and approval process. So what an organization that was interested would do is first you would need to have a training program, a curriculum that has been developed and created for use with peers. And then you'd fill out that application, which has a number of different questions on it about experience related to training traditional health workers, making sure that there's really a key understanding of what the specific training role is that the organization is hoping to train. So let's say peer support in this case, you know, making sure that the trainers really have an understanding of peer support and that there are folks with lived experience doing peer support who are involved in that training development as well. So keeping in mind that, that quote, we've all probably heard millions of times, nothing about us without us. So oh, we yes. absolutely want to maintain that here as well. So then training programs submit that application, provide their curriculum, their materials to the Office of Equity and Inclusion, and we then review that in the training evaluation and metrics program scoring subcommittee. And that application is available online if you're interested in seeing what sort of information is requested there. Okay. Brilliant, lastly, thank you. Lastly, thank you lastly, lastly, I would also say, remember these are not copy paste. So what I always would say to people, if you wanna model, and this is important, we have to have every training in every part of our state and coastal trainings, for example, is really needed, other rural parts. What I would usually start with, you know, there are a lot of organizations like MHO, MACBO, uh, Fork Time, a bunch of, the, a lot of organizations that are on, listed on our website, who also have this model of train the trainer that they already have, where they are willing to come and provide, and you know, you can, your organization can partner with them to really even bring that curriculum while you identify the peers who will deliver this training with the lived experience, with the understanding of the peer world, co-developing with them. And you can cater to Coastal Oregon as far as, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's always uh, trainers out there who do this work every day. It's like reaching out to them and say, hey, we would love a training here uh, that we can run our own. Can we be able to use your curriculum? How does that work? It goes from there, and we are willing to connect you with people that may be able to uh, to go in. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna uh, cruise us through here because, like, I have we have to shut up in uh, 90 minutes, <laughs> uh, and I wanna make sure we all get to the key points and questions that all of you may have. So here, simply, uh, this is what you know. According to Oregon, this is how peers are defined in terms of their certification. Those are the list I talked about it but I will dive in more. If you wanna to go to the next slide. 
So these are like some key provisions. I'm gonna talk a little bit here in depth, but one thing you need to know when we talk about peer certification, there are key elements like I talked about. The training is one of them. And then you come to the state certification once you finish your training. Uh, one other big thing I'm gonna mention is about grandfathering. So a lot of people may not know what we call grandparenting. So the essence of this is if you have, you are someone who has been doing this work with prior lived experience in addiction, mental health world, and you understand it, and you have so many trainings prior, you don't need to go to another training to state to, to become certified with the state. You just need to grandfather, meaning you can document 2000 worth of hours of work volunteering or you have done this work in either in a church a basement or anywhere or even in an internship format or you have done in volunteering somewhere 2000 watt of hours is what you need to be certified by the state to recognize your lived experience and the work you put in and there's an application with the same application that someone with the training is the same application you're going to use to say i need to be grandfathered in i can you know, i have the lived experience experience, I have everything. And if let's say you are seeking mental health, grandparenting, you can do that. If you are seeking addiction, mana, you know, addiction, uh, grandparenting, you can do that. The 2000 hours worth of work is the requirements. And then there's also a recommendation letter from, you know, former supervisor, pastors, or anyone you worked with, like can write for you saying this person has worked to that. How do you prove the hours? Sometimes if you worked in a places, the HR people or people who you worked with can say, you know, X, Y, and Z has worked this amount of hours in our agency or in our, you know, place. That is a way to, uh, to grandfather in. And then once we hear that, we'll be bringing in it to, to, to do certification, uh, uh, certification, you know, submit your certification and then, you know, we will process it. As all of you know, uh, we are a government. So any bit, any bit of things we certify, you are required to do background check. And I'm gonna talk a little bit of that in a little bit here for the sake of time. But what does the background check entails? One is required by law from everybody. And whether it's employment, you know, every, even the state certification, we require background check. But what happens if you have a prior history of conviction or other things that are affiliated with your record that may impact the background check process? But then the state came up with a weight test determination, which is technically saying uh, that, well, you know, with your prior lived history and, you know, uh, with the conviction, that shouldn't stop you to become certified. So what we have is we do have a weight test process where technically would be, you know, uh, uh, it's a scale you're looking in. On the right hand side, maybe is the work you do. On the left hand side is your prior history of the conviction or anything that's related to your you know history or of crime or whatever but then what happens the state will do would be this you saying look four years ago ten years ago this is what has happened to me now in 2020 this is what i have done this is how i have shifted things a little over my life to help other members in the community this is what I'm doing now. This is what I'm involved with. It is somehow relieving your trauma, but it's another way to jump through the red tapes of government, telling them, look, it is not who I was. If there was a stealing record on my record, that is not who I am today. These are the, all the good things that I have done. So then you submit that alongside with your application. The people in the background check will look this and determine is this person the same person he was five years ago or is this a different person we are talking to to, to really want to certify on the basis of that they really certify people They're looking the right hand over ways what we are passed towards and that is what the way test purpose is and then there are certain small exclusion lists that we call you know that are uh, no no if you have any of those even with macbo as well as with uh with the state certification uh, uh, these are no, no, which is, you know, six major crimes, which, which involves like murder, second degree murder. Uh, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, sexual penetration one, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, there's like a list of six major crimes that you commit. Those are like a no, no, but anything else beyond those six major crimes, they are all out ways. They can be weight tested and then they can go. 
And then another thing as well, we, the state has a contract with our addiction, uh, peer support recovery folks. Uh, we have a contract with MACBO where MACBO can do a, a background check for them for the addiction recovery folks. And then they can send us the information to us which we have this contractual agreement with MACBO where MACBO will do the, you know, the application screening as well as the background check for them. And they will give us the data of that person saying, you know, this person has been vetted and screened uh, through the background check through MACBO. And then with that, then those people will be certified for the adults addiction in our state registered and they will be okay to go in. Both ways are viable option. If you don't want to go with MACPO, you want to do the weight test, still you will be certified as well as, you know, you will be certified. If you don't have prior history, it's all long, long good. You don't need to do the weight test. It's only if someone with prior history has that thing, things might come up, they want to mention ahead of time so that that should not become an obstacle when they are getting screened for the background check. That is the whole purpose of it. And then there's a continuous education requirements that is required. Every three years, you are required to earn 20 hours of CEUs. These days, we have freed all because of COVID. You can get all online. It can be any from approved training organization from the state, anything else. And then, or it can be non, you know, OHA approved training. As far as the continuous education piece you are taking has some kind of work related to the field you are involved in. If you spear related CEU, take it, we will consider that. I know there's a hand for Rendell. Uh, you wanna go to the next slide uh, and then we'll, I'm gonna answer Rendell's uh, questions. Yes, take it. Renel, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I didn't pay attention my, question, <laughs> my question was, I have two questions. The first one is, um, if you have had it, traditional health workers certification before and it lapsed or you you know you didn't recertify right away uh, which one would it be the grandfathering or the just a new application how would that work so it depends and this is a challenge we have with a lot of people out there i'm like ah <laughs> killing us so uh technically what uh, beyond six months we now like by law it's like according to the rules 30 days, you abandon, you don't want to be back, be it, you are gone. But these days, what I did administratively, we said, you know, beyond six months, if you still like in the lapsing area, you can recertify, you can submit your continuous education, we will consider that. Above six months, we require people, maybe, you know, three years is long enough, maybe you are not doing that work. Go take a training and then you restart over. If you want a grandfather, you can grandfather in, but it's not a back door for like, you know, you fail to your uh, certification and you did not, you know, resubmit. I mean, getting, you know, continuous education for three years, 20 hours is like very minimum, but not everybody can, you know, do it on time. So what we recommend is taking another training to get fresh in the field, because all of you know, the world of behavioral health is evolving and changing over time. Uh, the, the same status quo, you know, training might not be the same. There's a lot of new information added. So getting updated and getting the things and submitting initial application again would be the perfect one. Well. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just complicated with COVID and everything. We've had supervisor changes. We've had so much, so many changes in our organization and so much turnover that yeah. we missed it. We just, we missed the boat. And my Hola. manager, my manager did not bring year. it up until a few weeks ago. So, um, okay. yeah. Feel free to talk me offline, and my contact information will be here. I'll be happy to like address. Uh, you know, uh, if it's more than six months, what can we do? Uh, we're trying to create some leeways here and there, but you know, we also have this state obligation to make sure we we vetting people correctly. But overall, this is like the way certification work. I'm not gonna dive in here. This is how the grandparenting kind of goes in. And on your left side is the standard certification. You complete your training, you submit an application, you get the you know, background check cleared, and then you go to the state registry. That's how simple as that. And then the grandparenting is the same there on the, on the second left. But a visual certification is people who have like incomplete 
for example, they did not, they completed one part, but they just want to, you know, I want to do this one year and see how it goes. We do, but I mean, above all, we never ever provide this kind of certification. I've never seen anyone choosing one year. Uh, it's been always three years uh, that most people will certify for. Next slide. So this is what will happen after certification. You technically, you know, uh, uh, once you get certified with the state, we, we, we put you on the state register where your contact information, like your name is available there, that you are certified by a peer. It also have even a lot of other more data, like your county, which part of the city, which state, which part of the county you are available. So if some health systems or individuals that, uh, you know, finish a training, uh, and get certified with the state, any CCO or anyone looking for peers, they can find your information there in their service area. Some people will leave their name and email there. Some people would put their name only. Some people put even their phone number, just in case it's like a hub, a state registry. And even our Medicaid population, when it comes to billing, if they want to bet, if you are really certified, they go to this state registry. And that is the process so far it is uh, that we undertake it through, yeah. Next slide. I believe this one is this me. This is your show. All right. So first I see a hand up from Joshua. Just wanted to check in and, and see if that was a question. Uh, yeah, uh, I had a question. Uh, can potentially answer it later, but I just know that there was like $64 million cut in like mental health services in Oregon. I was just wondering how that uh, affects billing for peer support workers and traditional health care workers. So, so the way it does work would be, I think, you know, the state has some several structures. One, all of you know uh, that 90% of Medicaid dollars that the state get, it goes to CCOs. 90%. Only this 10%, we call it open card population, people who don't choose CCO, that they are in this bucket of, you know, group that receive Medicare, Medicare, and the state assigns them any health system like Borobaila, Legacy, you know, Providence, or uh, any hospital uh, out there. Uh, but technically, uh, that is like 90% of the bucket of Medicaid funding that the, the state gets from the federal usually go to CCOs. But then addressing some of this bucket, like the, the, the money you talk to, what the state sometimes has is another structure where they will try to like disperse this money to county health you know, uh, departments that are in different parts of the state as a grant format so that they can contract with you know, uh, PRN organizations to deliver, uh, to have to, to contact with community-based organizations doing the work to really channel this money to address it more deeper into, into the community. That's the kind of structure sometimes the state uses. And, but I'm happy to, uh, to, uh, to filter through to, to get to you, like uh, connect with my behavioral health folks in the state to ask them, how is this money, you know, really being dispersed? Sometimes they channel it through CCOs Sometimes they will be like making like state grant funding to, to go to county behavioral health, you know, centers so that the county can out then outward partner with CCO, with the CBOs, like community-based organizations, mental health centers to really get the money and then so they can continue to provide the services. That's how it kind of gets dispersed most of, but I'm happy to find more info for you. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So before I start talking about facilitating peer support supervision, I want to first acknowledge the resource and reference where the information came from that we're going to be talking about today. And that is from the Substance Use Disorder Peer Supervision Competencies. That was a document published in 2017, just a couple of years ago by the Regional Facilitation Center and um, a number of peers worked on that document and on the committees reviewing all of the competencies and information that was compiled there. So I just wanna have a, a brief second to acknowledge and appreciate all the work that went into that. And that is available online for free if anybody is interested in looking more in depth 
into that uh, peer supervision competencies document. So it covers 20 different peer supervision competencies. And today we're just gonna look at a couple of them just in the interest of time, the ones that are more focused on recovery orientation. So the very first thing that is really critical to have within peer support supervision and as a peer supervisor is understanding the peer role. It is really, really, so critical to have that strong understanding of peer roles so that effective supervision can be provided. And part of this is also having that lived experience of recovery or of mental health challenges as well. So one of the things that I find really helpful about the uh, SUD peer supervision competencies is you can use it in your own work. So they have checklists for each competency that look at knowledge, skills, and abilities, or KSAs, and break it down. So I can go in there and go, okay, how am I doing in this area? Or maybe there's a couple things that I need to work on. So it can be something that is very practical in addition to educational. So recovery orientation, is something that is also important to peer support supervision. Critical that the supervisor understands and supports the philosophy of recovery and recovery-oriented systems of care. You know, promoting things like hope, self-disclosure, mutuality, even the language that we use, making that person first, you know, um, working around empowerment and keeping peer services voluntary and directed by those that we are working with, keeping it person directed, you know, utilizing and really supporting, seeing the strengths in those that we work with. So all of these things are going to be important for a supervisor to have. And I understand that across the state, we're in different places related to peer support supervision. I hear from some peers in various parts of the state who may not have access to a supervisor or they may see a supervisor very infrequently. So I want to acknowledge that sometimes happens. And then sometimes folks have a peer supervisor who not only understands the role, has that recovery orientation, has that lived experience, has that experience working within peer support as well. So we, we all can be in sort of unique circumstances depending on what our supervision looks like. And these competencies are designed to really outline what an ideal scenario would look like, what we would look for in terms of knowledge, skills, and abilities related to supervision of peers. We've got a couple more that I wanna quickly cover here. I'm just checking in to make sure we've got no raised hands or questions. And in this, we also want to model principles of, principles of recovery. So walk in the talk or talk in the walk. I always mix up the order of that phrase. <laughs> but doing as we share and making sure that we are, we are honest and truthful within that, you know, incorporating values, recovery values within the work that we do and how we connect with others and also how we are as supervisors. Something else that's really important is a supervisor needs to support meaningful roles for peers. Sometimes I hear from folks who go, Adrian, I'm, I'm not really sure what to do. It seems like in my peer role, I'm mainly grabbing coffee for people or I'm mainly doing something that is not a meaningful peer role and is not in line with the peer scope of practice. So hopefully folks will be connected with supervisors who will support that meaningful role development within our peer scope of practice and in line with those peer and recovery values. And then the final competency from this SUD uh, manual that we pulled from is recognizing the importance of addressing trauma, social inequities, and healthcare disparities. 
So supervisors need to understand trauma-informed care and the principles in line with that, incorporate that within supervision, and also understand and work around social and healthcare equities and promoting those. And so that needs to happen at all levels of the organization. And so I want to pause here and see if there are any questions before we go into opportunities for integration next. All right. I am not seeing any questions, so I'm just going to move forward into opportunities for integrating peer traditional health workers. So this can happen at the coordinated, within coordinated care organizations, within counties, within other organizations as well. And so there are different roles that different partners can play in supporting the integration of peer support, peer wellness, peer recovery roles. So opportunities for coordinated care organizations and counties include partnering with community-based organizations with peer-run organizations to get feedback and input and really come to an understanding of what the community needs and what those organizations need, what we need in peer roles in order to be successful to do our jobs and serve those that we support as peers. It is also an important task at the county or coordinated care organization or governmental level to identify peer support disparities and look at those disparities and, and figure out ways to promote equity and reduce those disparities within the um, services that are being provided and the groups that are being served. Many times counties may elect to subcontract with coordinated, sorry, not coordinated, community, <laughs> community-based organizations or peer-run organizations serving specific communities because just like in peer work, we believe that folks who have lived experience who are a part of that community have a special connection to that community and with that lived experience. So sometimes that work is not best done by a governmental agency or by a coordinated care organization, but instead by a culturally specific organization or another community-based organization that is really connected to serving a specific community. Of course, one of the important things is going to be the money, right? So providing funding to finance outreach, peer support activities, you know, including utilization within other systems that, that might be child welfare, within local hospitals, within correction systems, drop-in centers, all different types of places. But it's important to have that funding available so programs can grow, and then those working within those programs can also be paid a fair and equitable wage. Community-based organizations also have a role in integration. So this is oftentimes where the training happens that we were talking about earlier. So within community-based organizations, we can train peers to be certified in in um, all the various roles that we hold as peers on how to effectively provide support on how to navigate those complex systems that are out there that many of us work within from day to day. Community-based organizations can then employ and support peers to work within the communities that they serve and also provide quality supervision to the peers that are employed within the community-based organization. At the peer level, we then meet individuals where they're at and support them in exploring the goals that they set for themselves without bringing an agenda of our own, just meeting people where they're at and walking alongside them in 
their own journey with the goals that they have set for themselves. As peers, we also provide ongoing support and system navigation, working with those individuals on those self-directed goals, even if they're transitioning from system to system or working with other folks for their services, we can be flexible. And the specifics of what this looks like can absolutely vary from organization to organization. You know, sometimes there are differences in how we work with people or how long we can continue to support our peers, things like that. That's something that can change from organization to organization. Then I also want to look at here the role of the community member or the person that is receiving the support. So peer support is always optional. It's never something that I can be told, you have to receive peer support, you must do that. And I think that's one of the things that's really so valuable about peer support is that we are not forced into receiving it. It is that person's right and that person's option to receive peer support. And at that same time, if I have a couple times that I meet with someone and they go, you know what, maybe I'm not interested in peer support right now. That's their right and that's okay. And if they would like to connect in the future, we can be available for that as well at their direction, led by the person that we are receiving, that we are providing supports to and walking alongside. Peer support can be an excellent way to provide culturally and linguistically appropriate services, making sure that folks have access to services in their preferred language and in a way that is respectful of and understanding of their culture. Community members that we work with can connect with us in the ways that work best for them. You know, some folks might want a regular check-in. Some folks might say, hey, you know, I'll be the one to reach out to you. That's what works best for me as if I initiate that conversation. So it's all about learning from each person that we support what works best for them. And that's both a conversation and an exploration. And peer support is, is really an incredible way to connect with and support people, especially amongst these times where it was shared earlier, you know, all of these statistics and all of these kind of sombering facts about, wow, you know, Oregon, we're towards the bottom. Well, we are at the bottom of the list when it comes to mental health and addiction within our state and rates of that. And so the roles that we have as peers are really critical because we are supporting people where they're at and I have seen so much recovery happen related to peer support. And I really think that is an amazing thing. So I wanna pause there and see, we've got about seven minutes left to see what questions there are from folks. And feel free if you have a question, feel free to either unmute yourself or raise your hand and we can respond to questions there. There's also the chat box. And can I just say one last quick uh, thing? Uh, I think one thing I wanted to shout out on the state certification, uh, it is more a bureaucratic process. So I just wanted to shout to all of you that when you submit an application, let's say to, to the state, remember, let's say, uh, you use a work email or anything like that. One I always tell preferably use your own personal email. Don't use your work email. There are many million reasons and gillions reasons for that. The reason is like if you leave your job, the email the state will keep sending that email to your job unless you update and update to us. So so the best way I always would advise people, use your personal email. Secondly, whenever you submit the application to the state, uh uh, Rafael and now it takes a month uh, uh, to get back to people because of resources and COVID and other things. It shouldn't be that way. Uh, we are shifting to a way where people will enter their own application online. 
down the road, maybe in 2021. I'm not optimistic about slow government, but we are getting there. But one thing I wanted to say, when you submit application, staying on top of your email is critical because when we receive it, we send you the safety notice. But then when they initiate background check, you'll get an email from the background check and you only have 14 days to respond. If you don't respond, you will close out. Meaning we wouldn't know that you did not respond to it because we wouldn't go back to individuals looking each for each person all the time. We have about 4,000 workforce around the state and it's about like two FTE that are doing this work, like two full-time people, about 4,000 people. You can imagine. So the resources are thin. So it's very important. If you submit an application to the state, please stay on the game of like watching the email all the time. That helps you to like get a faster. I have people go through like seven days and I have people who are like two years because it is like they are not somehow checking things on, on time. When you close out, we have to also then initiate you again one more time to reopen the background check for you. And the background check is not done by us. It's a whole different unit outside of our division, outside of our pocket. And they do even millions of background check for the state from childcare to anything. So it's like you are in the midst of that people. So staying on top of your game will help a faster, smooth process of certification. I just wanted to shout out that. And you know, my email is there. Uh, if you get stuck for whatever reason, I'm always available to respond by email. And I will answer your question within as much as I could in the same day or so. Thank you. And we'd love to take any questions from folks. Thank you. This is Adrian, and I see a couple comments that had come through the chat that I want to address. So these slides will be available. They will be posted up on the Purepocalypse website as well as the recording. It will, I want to let everyone know it will take a little bit of time before they're available just because while the conference is ongoing, all of our team and all of our efforts are really focused on the conference while it's live. So it will probably be a week or two after the conference while we get all the recordings back from presenters and slides for those presenters that have opted in and have consented to sharing their slides and recording with us, we can then get that up on the Purepocalypse website. So please look out for that, but those, those will be available. And then another question that I had seen was, do I need 20 hours or 40 hours of continuing education units for THW recertification for peer support specialists? You will need 20 hours within that three year period to if, renew. If you are not a family peer. So I forgot that, but thank you for the person who asked that. If you are a family peer, the requirements like you get 40 hours of, uh, of continuous act to really understand what you are needed. And that was what the family peer movement wanted to do. And that's how it is. It's not something that the state came up with, but it was more around the family peer, you know, uh, network wanted to make sure people are well understood, you know, have the knowledge and education. So if you are a family peer, you are required to have 40 hours of continuous ed. But if you are any other peer, like adults, addiction, mental health in our adult world, there's only 20 hours of CEUs. Yes, thank you. And one other question that I had seen was, are there virtual initial peer support specialist certification trainings that are happening? So in, gosh, I think it was a couple months ago now, it, Time kind of passes kind of strangely these days, it seems. But the Oregon Health Authority Office of Equity and Inclusion released a memo with guidance for training organizations stating that training organizations who are currently approved can provide components of their training online that would still make sure that those trainees, that folks who are taking the training, are still going to leave with the same knowledge, skills, and abilities that they need in order to be ready to be certified within that uh, specific training that they are looking for certification from. So 
I uh -huh. do not believe there are any 100% online trainings just because of that requirement to make sure that there is some type of um, in-person component for those sections that are really critical to becoming certified in peer support. And one other thing we are doing, uh, we came to realize all of you COVID dropped in our while, no one knew what would happen, but at the end, what we're intending to do is make sure maybe with COVID around for a longer time, we are coming up with ways to really waive some of these challenges and concerns that people have to part of certification. We may start having COVID until next year is what the projection is. So we are shifting how our continuous education requirements and trainings requirements may be moved a little bit around. So then down the road, we will not have any of these in-person requirements. That's the, the, the place we are le leading to since we know no more in-person will be around. So uh, you don't need to code your certification, just document those hours and then have it available and ready showing them the proof here. Yeah. Thank you. And the other question was just asking for your uh, contact information, which is mohammed.abdiasis at dhsoha.state.or.us. And that's listed up here on this slide as well. So I hope everybody is able to see that okay. And we are coming up on 1030 Pacific, 130 Central Time. 2.30, if my math is right, over on the East yeah. Coast. Yep. So all that to say, we're coming up to where we need to wrap this presentation. I want to thank everyone so much for being here today with us and really appreciated all of the questions and thought that you all had. This slide, these slides, as well as the recording of this workshop will be available online on the Peerpocalypse website probably within the next week or two. But thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I am going to close this meeting room. So thank you so much and hope to see you all in another workshop. Thanks, bye-bye.